Did you all, I guess, I know, Lindsay, it sounds like you're still at work, but do the the rest of you have a drink for the drink segment? Yeah. I have a drink. Ooh, excellent. I'm excited. I had to make sure I was prepared. Good. Well, you've been on the show before, Lindsay. You know what's up. Well, only sort of. (laughs) From ScienceSortOf.com, you're listening to Science Sort Of. to science sort of you're listening to episode 331 our theme this episode is just another mammoth monday i'm your host ryan haupt joining me to talk about things that are science things that are sort of science and things that wish they were science it's the mammoth monday himself abe padilla yes yes that's quite the introduction i guess <laughs> yeah i don't really know what yeah it's uh, you know we're riffing on just another manic monday and this episode will come out on a thursday so it's you know, it's kind of a hot it, mess it but is, yeah. it's, it's fine it's how we, that's how we do things around here and joining us to talk about Mammoth Mastodons and other Probosidians, oh my, I'm super excited by our two guests. Super excited to get these two guests together, because it's kind of strange that they aren't already uh, well acquainted with each other. We're being joined by the official paleontologist for the Waco Mammoth National Memorial, Lindsay Yan. Hi, Ryan and Abe. Thanks for having me. She's the Yan with the plan, according to the Waco <laughs> Tribune Herald <laughs> article about her being hired by the National Park Service. And you... you can better believe that I will be posting a link to that in the show notes because that article headline just makes me giggle every time. We are also being joined by the Gaylord Donnelly Postdoctoral Associate in Environmental Science at the Yale Institute for Biospheric Studies. Advait Zucker is here. Hey, Ryan. Hey, Abe. It's, it's good to be here. Welcome. Good to have you all with us. So, Abe, you want to tell us what's going on old Mexico way? Oh, there's all kinds of stuff going on in Mexico, but one particular thing that is going on that caught our attention is that there is a new airport construction zone happening, well, construction site that is happening, very happening right now, just north of Mexico City. And the reason it's caught our attention is because over the last year or two since construction began on the new Santa Lucia airport, the construction crew has unearthed at least 200 separate specimens of mammoth skeletons, which is really exciting. So yeah, we have a a story that we're looking at that was covered by the Los Angeles Times. And of course, we'll link to that in the show notes. And so this has been sort of ongoing and it's just uh, incredible that they continue to find more and more fossils. Yeah, and I thought it was worth bringing up because I feel like people who aren't super familiar with paleontology and archaeology may be surprised to know that how often things are discovered via construction sites. And I thought this would also be a nice opportunity for Lindsay to tell us a little bit about the Waco site and the work she's doing. So, Lindsay, what's your what's your take on this and, and how does this compare to where you are working in Texas? This article and this whole find is just really exciting. So not my original research, but since I've come to Waco Mammoth Looking at these large herds or large accumulations of mammoths and other animals has really been something that's, it's it's a lot of fun. And part of our site was found by construction. It's one of those common ways that fossils are discovered. And half of our site, they were backhoeing and hit another bone and uncovered an entire another section of fossils. So seeing all of these different large deposits of fossils pop up all over North America, all over the world, is really interesting. And I'm curious to see how the future research from that site is going to tie into our site and then maybe like the South Dakota Mammoth site and Hot Springs. I guess we should probably, I I assumed that most of our listeners were familiar with what a mammoth is, but they might be surprised to hear about them coming from, you know, Southern North America, where we think of it as being pretty hot. Advite, can you give us like a a little bit of an introduction to what these animals are or were exactly? Yeah, totally. So mammoths are very, very large elephants. They belong to the family Elephantidae, which includes the modern day Asian and two species of African elephants. And like all elephants, they first evolved in Africa about 6 million years ago and then disperse out. And there are a, a number of species. They first sort of disperse through Europe and Asia and then cross over across the Bering Land Bridge and enter North America sometime around 1.3 million years ago. 
and then they go south. And the Mammoth Range goes all the way from from the Yukon and Alaska in the north, all the way down to to Central America in the south. And there are probably three to four species of mammoth in North America uh, uh, alone. What you have down in Mexico is the large species called the Colombian mammoth, which was about 14 feet high at the shoulder and weighed close to 10 to 12 tons. That's about three to four tons more than an average African elephant. So these are very, very large animals. And what do we, I mean, finding 200 of them in one spot. So this article talked about there being 61 at Mammoth Hot Springs in South Dakota. How many do you have at your site, Lindsay? We have 23 or 24 individuals. Do we know anything about their their herding dynamics? So, you know, I think of modern elephants as being a herding animal. So what do we know? I mean, I, I would assume based on finding them in these large numbers together that we have some inference about their social life. Well, we, yes, hopefully. And we get that here at Waco, but we get a complete opposite at the Mammoth Hot Springs site in South Dakota. So it really depends on how and why these animals came to this area to whether or not we'll be able to figure out if we've got a nursery herd like we do here in Waco, which is predominantly females and their offspring. Where and, that, and that's why it's a nursery herd? because Exactly. They, okay. So until the males are... Reaching puberty, they'll stay in the herd and then move with the matriarchal herd. And that's what we have preserved here. And that's very similar to what modern elephants do, right? Yeah, and we use the modern elephants as a way to really understand these fossils because we can't go back and just watch these mammoths walking around. So if we can understand what our elephants are doing, we should be able to get a good idea of what these animals were like. And unfortunately, well, not unfortunately, but just because this is such a new find in outside Mexico City, th- this isn't a scientific paper that we have to, to reference yet. So we don't have a ton of information on the, the geology or the context or something like that. But we can tell from the way it's reported in the LA Times, it seems like this was sort of a lacustrian or a lake side environment that they got trapped in. Is that common? What, what kind of environments do we typically find mammoths in Advite? So the hot springs mammoths, for example, which are in South Dakota, were found in an, in an ancient sinkhole or pond. And unlike Waco, which I think is a is a stream bed, you have all of these subadult males coming in and, and falling into this sinkhole in the winter and dying because because they because they either can't get out or they're struggling and getting exhausted and just drowning in in the in the water and and the mud but but you find them in in all kinds of environments in these in these volcanic ash beds down in mexico or in in lake deposits and stream deposits and in ponds or in hot springs lots of different places and so does that give us a sense of like what they were eating or what, you know, how they were getting by in their environment? What kind of information do we have about that? So based on the hot springs mammoths, we know that they were probably trying to get at this at this hot spring because there was vegetation growing around it in the winter months where it gets fairly cold in the Dakotas. Mammoths are grazers. They've got these fairly tall teeth, which are fairly well adapted to uh, crushing up grass, which is abrasive. And we think that these that these hot springs allowed for 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 fresh grass to to to, to, to grow, and that attracted lots of of large animals like like these mammoths, and and they go there and then they fall in and they get trapped. Right, and we think of them as woolly mammoths. So we're finding them in places like Texas, Mexico, around hot springs. Were they actually not as cold adapted as people think? Or was it just a colder climate in general back then during the ice age? What's kind of going on right. geologically at the time? That's a great question. So the mammoths that we find south of the ice are predominantly Colombian mammoths. So it's a different species from the woolly mammoth, which is typically found in, in parts of Siberia, parts of, of northern Europe, Alaska, and the Yukon, and and you do have small pockets of these of these woolies which came down through the ice corridors and were then found in the Great Lakes region. But most of the mammoths that you find in the American Southwest, for example, or in the La Brea Tar Pits, are these large Colombian mammoths, and we don't think they were as hairy as the woolies. Oh, interesting. I guess oh. I didn't realize that. Yeah, it it it, it seems like the woolies were the exception more than the rule. Most proboscideans don't have a lot of body hair. And proboscideans are any of the long snouted trunked elephant like animals. Right, yeah. So the, the proboscidea is just the larger order of, of mammals which includes elephants and their extinct 
relative. So this includes animals like mammoths and mastodons and even the, the strange shovel tusk uh, gomphothers. Not all elephants had tusks uh, or trunks. The earliest ones looked kind of like pigs and they lived in, in North Africa. But, but we know that, uh, that, that they belong to this group based on, on, on certain characteristics of their, of, of their skull and of their teeth. The cyclops looking skull. <laughs> cyclops, yeah. So those were those, those were probably dwarf elephants from the Mediterranean islands. I think there, there's this this I, this this idea of this giant with one eye probably comes from sailors finding skulls of of pygmy elephants on the Mediterranean islands. And modern day elephants have this this large hole on their skull, which is where the trunk ex- extends from. It's basically their nostril. And to the untrained eye, it, it can look like a, an eye. An eye <laughs> to the <laughs> untrained <laughs> eyes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it, it can totally look, I mean, it's it's not hard to see how you could reconstruct an elephant skull or a mammoth skull to the, you know, kind of this ogre-esque looking cyclops dude. My buddy Kieran Gillen, who's a comic book writer, told me about an idea I had for a story that, that he never ended up doing anything with. So I guess I, I don't feel too bad spoiling it here. But he, it was about a, a hunter in the ancient world who had heard stories about mammoths and was very excited to go out and hunt one and prove that he was this great, powerful hunter. And so it was going to be like this travel book where he's going across the ancient world, you know, tracking uh, down the legends of these beasts. And then he gets to the island in the Mediterranean. And it's like this four foot tall little <laughs> thing. And, and the, the joke would be that he assumes that all the stories were over exaggerated without realizing that it was just he stumbled across the last remaining island dwarfs. Yeah. Uh, and. <laughs> You know, the, the, cr- the crazy thing is that we had island wharfs in the U.S. as well. So if, if you go to, to Santa Rosa Island off the coast of, of California, you have pygmy mammoths there. And it seems uh-huh. like a population of Colombian mammoths got stranded on these islands. And over time, because of the process of island dwarfism, they got pretty small. I think the biggest ones were only about six feet high at, at the shoulder. It's about as tall as, as, a, as, as an average male. Getting back to the site in... Outside Mexico City, I mean, 200 mammoths is insane. That's, yeah. that's just a crazy amount of mammoths. Uh, also, 25 camels and five horses, which, Lindsay, you can probably speak more to. That uh, People might be surprised to hear about camels in North America. Yes, that's one of those little eye-popping uh, tidbits that I get to tell the visitors here. Camels also evolved in North America. And they just they didn't migrate out of North America until maybe... 8 million years ago, and then moved to South America maybe 3 million years ago. So they've been in North America up until the last 10 or 12,000 years. Um, So it's actually very typical for a place to see an environment to have these mammoths and camels and horses. They often are found together. We have these same animals at our site, and I'm pretty sure that that goes for the Hot Springs site as well. So camels are out there and abundant. And uh, horses went extinct too. So these aren't the same horses that we have in in North America today, right? Some of them are. Oh. Some of them are. Yeah, so maybe not the ones down in Mexico, but some of the horses that lived in the Ice Age in North America were the same species, Equus uh, uh, ferris, that that, that you find on the plains of of Mongolia, for example. But they did go locally extinct and were reintroduced regardless? or Yeah, yeah, okay. okay. So, so, so we lost all three of these groups of animals, and then we've reintroduced two thirds. We've, we've got you know some uh, all in domestic and zoo environments. Were these camels and horses? Would they be recognizable to us as camels and horses, or did they look significantly different back in the Pleistocene? As far as we know, they would have looked pretty much the same. I guess there's a little bit of debate on whether or not our camels truly had a hump or not during the Pleistocene. But that doesn't tend to preserve in the fossil record. No, that soft tissue. What? <laughs> I know. Come on. Um, There's no bone in the hump. How does it hold itself up? I know, and we we just don't have enough evidence. So we can't even tell if these were one humpers or two humpers or maybe no humpers. Right. I it, I definitely have heard that kind of leaning on the no humpers, but I don't know if that's a a true thing or not. Are llamas considered like no hump camels? Well, or? but llamas are not as closely related to true camels or these fossil camelops that we get in the Pleistocene. So we don't really want to use them for our um, reconstructions. Okay. So which which camels today are the most closely related to these Pleistocene camels, do we think? That would be the modern dromedary and bactrian camels. 
So Camillus. And are those are those sister taxa? You know, we I, don't, I don't actually know much about camel evolution or their uh, their phylogeny. So <laughs> it, it's currently unclear where dromedaries come from. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Interesting. Um, that is interesting. So, what do I mean? What do we think is going to happen with this? Two, where do you put two hundred mammoths? Right. <laughs> are, there, is, is, are they going to like build a new museum, or is there? A, do we have any sense? You know, it sounds like it's being excavated in part with the National Institute of Anthropology and History. But I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about the collections at a place like the Smithsonian, where I know we all have some experience. And I mean, you would even in a place like the Smithsonian, you'd have a hard time finding space for all this. Right. We don't have space for for two hundred mammoths at the Smithsonian. We would have to build. Well, and an entirely new pod out at, at at our support center in 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 Maryland for them. What you need is 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 a place like Waco or like Hot Springs where you build a a a, a museum right on top of the site. But yeah, or the like Dinosaur National Monument, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, that yeah. or Asheville, any of these places in in in, in the American. Midwest, where so you're saying know. this needs to be a, a dual use airport and natural history museum. Well, I, I think, think so. One that of the might terminals. actually be the plan. I think. <laughs> oh, really? I think either at the airport or somewhere within like a few kilometers, there's plans to build a museum to display some of this work. I don't know. I was just looking through some of the other literature, and I don't. There's no specifics on it, but I think that's the plan: is to at least make some of it available to the public. That would be pretty And I mean, cool. it, seems, it seems like the research questions you could ask if you have a sample. I mean, in paleontology, you know, if you get a sample set of a dozen individuals, that's a pretty good data set. You know, maybe it might not blow the pants off of people who are used to working with big data. I was applying for like a big data internship at one point. And they were like, what's the largest data set you've ever worked? And I was like, let me tell you, 5.2 megabytes. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> that was actually a modern ecology data set. That wasn't even a paleo data set. Um, so, you know, having having 200 individuals that you could use to, to ask questions take take samples from i mean that's incredible i mean it might not all be 200 of the of the same element right it's a minimum number of individuals sort of thing right. but it's still that's a crazy useful potential yeah. and one of the other interesting things that you know maybe will come out of this which the the article mentions is you know is there evidence for hunting or yes i'm glad you that right and that's fascinating to me because there is a site nearby the the site i think it's called san antonio shawento in the town of Tultepec, just south of Mexico City. I believe south, just near. But anyway, there's there's evidence on that site of mammoth bone tools. And there are also artificial pits that are thought to have been shallow mammoth traps basically dug up, you know, by the early inhabitants in hunting these mammoths. So it's interesting it's interesting to think, you know, what might we learn about something that's potentially five, six, seven times the size of that location in terms of, of the number of fossils. Right. And it's possible that the, there are so many mammoths at this one site because they were being hunted in that area right. or they're being taken advantage of from a scavenger scent. I guess part of the issue is we don't know exactly how old the site is. So, you know, they said in the article between 10,000 and 20,000 years ago, which would be the time frame in which humans arrive in that region as far as we know, uh, right. What's the earliest we have humans in, in definitively in North America at this point, or at least further south in North America? Oh boy, so, there was a there was a brand new site in Mexico which suggested that people were there at about thirty thousand years. So which that's crazy. That's a huge, which, which is, which is nuts. Because because wasn't I mean, wasn't the previous number in like the thirteen fourteen yeah. range? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So wow. south of the ice is about thirteen or or fourteen. You've got this site down in South America called Monte Verde where you get about fifteen thousand year old tools and of course up in in alaska you've got older sites but that's just because that seemed to have been a holding pen for uh, people before. And, this, and the south american site it's not clear if those people were contiguous with the ones coming across the land bridge or if that was an ocean right voyager right right, right. so um, if they just came down the coast which is how we we think most of the continent was populated before the ice melted and this is sort of one of those things in paleontology that I think is very interesting that it it all often get covered in the news, you know, oldest record of people found or whatever, because it's very it's, it's exciting and it's important work to be done. 
but the, that number is only ever going to go backwards in time, right? We're never going to be like, oh, the you, you might get for some of these really, really old sites, you might get a, a retraction saying that, oh, this probably wasn't actually people, but you're only ever going to be pushing that number further and further back. And um, evidence gets harder and harder to find the further you go back in time. It's an interesting quirk that like you're only ever moving backwards in time. And when we find what we know to be the oldest evidence of humans on the continent, we know that that's probably not the actual like first dude or woman who stepped off the land bridge like <laughs> oh, totally yeah so it's not it, it, it's that it's that whole scientist baffled paleontologists are usually not surprised when we find something a little bit older than what we thought it was originally because that's the trend and it confirms that the fossil record is imperfect and that when you find something when you find the first occurrence of something it's not likely to be the actual first time that thing was there and that happened well, right and it's important also that it's like it's not just an imperfect fossil record more importantly it's like it's an incomplete because of destruction you know like lack of preservation so which is, which is why it's important that we go out and watch these construction crews and, yep. and ask them to take a break or go have a coffee or dig somewhere else when we find cool stuff that we need to dig up more carefully yeah and and the great thing is that in in, in california there's actually a law which, which says that on on any construction site you need to have a, a paleo monitor out there in case they find any bones and in, in which case uh, one of my friends and, does that I and should. excavate them yeah I, we should we should invite her on the show have her tell us we about should. that Lindsay, we've danced around it a little bit and you've mentioned comparisons to the waco site but just generally now that you're you know you're relatively new in this position as the park paleontologist down there can you tell us just a little bit about about the site and what excites you about it and i know your research originally before this wasn't necessarily on proboscideans and so how have you kind of had to shift your thinking or what new, new stuff have you learned or just kind of give us an, a little bit of an overview sure um so yeah, my original research was still in the Pleistocene, but looking more at stable isotopes. So I've kind of had to switch a little bit and trying to look more at proboscideans, which are new to me or relatively new to me, and communities. Um, so our site, we have a nursery herd, which we've talked about. It's the moms and babies. And these animals were preserved about 65,000 years ago. And it's just... Most of the skeletons are in pretty good condition, um, but it's just an entire layer of mammoth bones. It, looking at the original pictures, it's quite impressive. And most of that material is in the collections at the Mayborn Museum at Baylor University, so that the general public doesn't get to see that material. But as we build a paleontology program here, those are the things that are going to become really important for research, whether it's comparing it with the site in Mexico or hot springs. But the Waco site is, it's a little bit older. We definitely don't have humans here because we have two deposits of fossils, one at 65,000 years ago and one at 51,000 years ago. So much older than the dates that we have for human occupation in North America. But it's still... I think this site and this Mexico site and future finds that we might have are really going to be able to give us a better understanding of how these animals lived and what their life was like and what nursery herds may have looked like, how animals traveled. And what I'm really interested in is looking at that mixed with um, what the environment was like and why were these animals here and what, what more can we find from these fossils? Um, and there have only been a couple of studies that have come out of the site. So it's one of those things that I have a lot of free reign to develop a really cool program here. Hopefully we'll be able to uh, answer some of the questions and figure out why our mammoths were here. And uh, is excavation ongoing at the, the site? So the excavation was done in the 80s and 90s and basically stopped at about 2001. And my, the goal is once I get situated and we figure out why we want to dig, we'll start digging again. But right now there is no active digging. You can still see fossils. We just don't get to go play out in the dirt. And if it's anything like every other site I've been to, how many jacketed specimens do you have that still need to be prepped out? Oh, God. We have, I think, something like 36 person years of preparation work to go on our jackets. So more than I'm probably going to be here. <laughs> <laughs> it's a deep time problem. Yes. 
<laughs> and is the, you know, we, we sort of avoided talking too much about COVID stuff on the show just because we want this to be a break from the horribleness of 2020 for folks when they listen. But is the site currently open to the public or can folks come visit or what should folks know about coming to visit when things are reopening? Yeah, so we are reopened and the dig shelter where you can go in and see our in-place skeletons is still open. We're not giving guided tours, but visitors are more than welcome to come and visit our climate-controlled dig shelter. We've got a giant male, and then we've got a couple of members of the nursery herd that are preserved in place. That's awesome. I think the only time I've been in a climate-controlled dig site, well, I visited Mammoth Hot Springs, but the only time I've actually done field work in a climate-controlled dig site was uh, Natural Trap Cave, and it's climate-controlled because it's a cave. <laughs> Yeah, I'm looking forward to working in this because it's we keep it about 68 to 70 year round and they pump in humidity as needed. So it's an ideal field site. Oh, that sounds pretty nice. Spoiled. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it doesn't sound like you would be in need of much refreshment in a situation like that. And uh, we're trying to, you know, wean ourselves off of straws. We don't have built-in straws like Probosidians, but you still might end up eventually wanting a drink. So we should talk about that in our next segment. What are we drinking? Straw or no straw? be an episode of science sort of if we didn't also talk about what we are drinking abe you gave me a beer yesterday oh. which is very nice of you and i'm not having that beer on the show today <laughs> because advite's here and so advite you want to guess what i'm drinking you might know oh geez it's something you recommended to me that's your hint oh. Wow. I have an idea. I've recommended several things to you. I don't remember. And you that. have. This this is a this has this has a good tie to our paleontological themes today. I don't have an idea and anymore. A good tie to from to where in the world you're from. Are you drinking I might like, still have an a idea. good Indian rum or something? I'm having old monk. <laughs> you got old monk? <laughs> I got <laughs> old monk. <laughs> I got seven-year-old blended old monk, very old vatted. Yeah. XXX rum. What? Where did you find this? I found this at one store in the in in Virginia at, at a Virginia ABC, but that's it. I my the the guy who runs the the liquor store I go to, he he had both this and the scotch. Nice. So he was, yeah, he was really excited when I asked for it. I don't know if he is specifically of Indian descent, but yeah, he was really eager to to pass it off when I came in after we were texting about it and asked for it. And it is a very nice rum. I'm just sipping it. I'm not doing anything yeah, yeah. fancy with it. I've been in kind of a, just a sipping mood nice. lately, but yeah, it's, it's a good little bottle of rum. It is my favorite rum. It's the rum of choice in India. It, it's, it's a very smooth liquor. I, 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 I'm a huge fan. So I'm very excited that you got it. Is it, is it, do they grow the sugar cane there in India as well? Yeah, I guess yeah, I, yeah. It, it's all indigenously made. Because I was very surprised when I found out that there was Indian scotch that Abe and I got to try that was yeah. very good. And, you know, that was going to be my guess, actually. <laughs> my bias is showing here that I just assumed India was the land of gin because I'm, I guess I'm just a dirty colonial. But um, <laughs> I was, I was surprised to learn of the diversity of beverages available from the subcontinent. It, it seems like rum was invented in India because sugarcane is a native crop. And it seems like fermented sugarcane juice was a thing that people drank for a long time. And I guess oh, rum cool. is not that ah. far away uh, from it. But that, but a GNT comes from the British Raj because you had uh, Falconer coming in who introduced uh, quinine um, and they wanted to drink it with something more palatable. So they just added that to rum. And that, that the hydroxychloroquine right. of its day. Oh, right, right, right. And <laughs> it, was, it was an anti malarial. That was the thought. Yes, yeah. So quinine is an anti malarial and you get it in tonic water and they wanted to drink it with something. So they just poured it in in a glass of gin and you had your your classic uh, gin and tonic 
bark, right? Yeah, yeah, the bark of the cinchona or cinchona tree. I always thought it was cinchona, but I, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, well, enough talk about what the Raj was drinking. What are you right, having? Right, so I'm drinking an East Rock Pilsner. So I live in New Haven, Connecticut, um, and I'm drinking a local beer from East Rock Brewery, which is up to the, the street from where I live. Uh, it's a nice light beer. Yeah, so I, I don't know what the weather's been like up there, but we've been having kind of an off again, on again, warm, cool fall in the in the DMV region, which I know you're familiar with too. Yep, it's um, about the same. Yeah. That's cool. Sounds good. Yeah. I, I've never actually been to New Haven. I've never been to Yale. I've never been to the Peabody. So I will have to maybe make a pilgrimage once it is safe to do so. And once the Peabody is open again, because we're closed for renovation and we'll probably uh, open in 2023 or a couple of years after that, because everything got slowed down with COVID. Yeah, I bet. Well, we'll talk more about that in, in a moment. But Abe, you want to let us in on what you're having? Sure. Well, I couldn't find a mammoth themed beer and so from the depths of my beer fridge the best i could find was a tyrannosaurus flex hazy double ipa the one animal who really couldn't no <laughs> <laughs> like they may have been suns out guns out well, but the guns were, were nothing. Well, they were they were pea shooters at best the, uh, the artwork on the can would say otherwise <laughs> fair enough yeah it's a pretty solid hazy i it's a little shy of the I, the double IPAs that I'm used to, but it's nonetheless a solid hazy IPA. It's made by New Realm Brewing Company. Did you say New Run? New Realm. Rail, New Realm. Realm. Yeah. Where, what Which, realm are they from? They have two realms, I guess. They Asgard? Have, uh, no, Midgard. <laughs> Midgard? Okay. Yeah, Midgard. Two parts Good of Midgard. Uh, Georgia, they have, a, they have a, a, I guess, a, a, a brewery in Atlanta, Georgia, and they have a brewery in Virginia Beach, Virginia, East Virginia. Thank you. Yep, of course. And uh, and I've been I've been making an effort to find locally produced beer. So I was pretty happy when I found this from a local local meaning Virginia East Virginia brewery. So yeah, Lindsay, you'll Thank notice you. I have him well trained I, to say East East Virginia every time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna. The only way I'm gonna win this is through concentrated propaganda. So I was told our friendship depended on it. So oh, geez, yeah. Wow. Like many other I things. I came down like that many much. other things, I am told our friendship depends on. <laughs> <laughs> like I got to stop playing that card so often. Uh, well, Lindsay, what about what about you? What are you enjoying? So thanks to you, Ryan, and a little bit to Abe, I've really been into the craft brew scene. So yes. that was one of the yeah. It's one of the things we checked out when we first moved to Waco. And it's a smaller beer scene here, but it's definitely growing. And one of the first beers that I came across was called The Hidden Herd. So Ooh, perfect. Yes. What? <laughs> it is Brotherwell Brewing, which is a local Waco brewery. And the can art has three uh, mammoths on it and... What is the tagline? The hidden herd is a humble beast that's sure to impress. It's a an amber lager, so I'm more of a dark beer fan, but it's easy drinking and it has mammoths on it. So it kind of won my heart right away. How long before Kevin quits his job and starts a brewery? What's the countdown on that? Um, I don't know that the prospects in Waco are that great yet. So... <laughs> Maybe we'll start some home brewing first, but um, the small child we have at home is making that a little difficult. Children love beer. So, yeah. Actually, that's not true. I, I, remember, I definitely, I definitely had the like experience as a, a little kid of you know dad offering me the sip of beer and thinking it was super gross. Um, same here. Same here. Yep, same here. And look at us now. Yeah. <laughs> you know. With Advai talking about the history of liquor on the Indian subcontinent, reminded me, Lindsay, of when we went to the Jack Daniels distillery mm. when we were both at Vanderbilt living in. Lindsay and I were former lab mates. She's been on the show before. People might remember this, but that's why Lindsay and Abe and I are all good friends. Abe, I don't think you were on that trip. Nope. <laughs> There's a podcast I listened to called The Sporkful. They just had a fascinating episode about the enslaved and then freed black man that worked with Jack Daniels to develop the distilling technique that became Jack Daniels whiskey. And apparently charcoal filtration is a common technique in West African cooking. 
as a way of purifying and filtering and and refining different kinds of things that are made in that culture and so it's entirely likely and you know this this um enslaved person or formerly enslaved person i can't remember his name off the top of my head is actually listed as the first master distiller for the distillery that ended up becoming jack daniels eventually so it was this really cool like little hidden bit of history of um west african influence in now a famous iconic american whiskey I think they need to incorporate that into the tour. They yeah. are actually. Oh, they are um, good. Yeah, no, it's uh, the episode is definitely worth listening to. It, it's the sort of thing where it seems like Jack Daniels and this gentleman had a really good relationship. Like they were really close and really friendly their whole lives, and their kids knew each other, and they both still have descendants living in in the uh, unfortunately named Lynchburg. It's Lynchburg or Lynchville. Lynchburg says Julie from the other room. But yeah, it sounds like Jack Daniels, the distillery, the company is is doing their best to do right and update the, you know, the tour and the, the corporate information to pay appropriate tribute to this guy's contribution. The guy's name was Nathan nearest green and he went by nearest, I think. So it's a very cool story worth checking out if, if people haven't heard it. Um, so good. Yeah. Sporkful is a good podcast in general. I, I recommend it. And much like we don't, I don't, what, how do I transition to the next story? I, well, before you do that, I've, I've got a quick question for Lindsay. So has the town of Waco kind of taken up the mammoth as its mascot now? or Because I, I think it should. It should, but the, I think the bigger issue is that we have the Chip and Joanna Gaines fixer-upper home improvement uh-huh. monopoly. Or I don't <laughs> I know exactly what you want to call it. <laughs> so we sometimes take a backseat to that. But if you take that out of the picture, then yeah, I would say that we're we've been adopted into the the city, and I think they even made a costume for the parade. We didn't get to do the parade this year, obviously, but next year I think we'll have someone dressed up, two people dressed up as a mammoth. So yeah, should be I feel like you guys can can totally capitalize on 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 all of this 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 great mammoth well, stuff that you guys have. Yeah, there. it does help. So when people come to town for the fixer upper or Magnolia. Um, We get a lot of tourists that come in and they were like, we needed something else to do. And we had no idea the site was here. So it's been, it's been kind of cool to see that grow and change is it's been a park for a while, but rekindling the support for it and really getting it out there, I think is, is helping that. Well, and they didn't have an on-staff paleontologist until you. No, I am. I am the first national park paleontologist. I'm here. impressed by that. I guess it's, it's also a, relatively new. Uh, so it was discovered in seven, 1978 and then a city park 10 years ago. And then it became a national monument five years ago. Okay. So they've had five years to figure out. To, to to bring someone them. in. <laughs> yes. Yes. It's it's government work. It is a yep. little bit slower sometimes. A lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think we've all got yep. varying degrees of experience in that realm. Yep. Well, speaking of you know, Lindsay migrated to Waco. Speaking of migration, <laughs> <laughs> let's talk about Mastodon migration in our next segment. A paper came out about mastodons migrating. What do we know? Yeah, so know? mastodons <laughs> are the third kind of proboscidean in North America. It's a fairly uh, famous uh, animal because uh, it, it's got a long history that's that's associated with the founding of the country. I mean, people like Jefferson were were obsessed with the American 
mastodons. And like and why were they obsessed? They were obsessed with them because they had no idea what these giant creatures were. They called them the 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 American incognitum. I mean, the first fossils were found by Europeans in I think 1705 um, in. New York State, and and the guy who found it was a Dutch tenant a farmer who promptly traded it in for a pint of rum. So your drink is actually quite appropriate for this yes. sort of yes. conversation. I mean, I mean, you know, we've, I think we've talked about it on the show before. Rum was the American colonial drink yep. uh, before whiskey became a thing. Whiskey only became a thing kind of post revolution because we weren't trading with the Caribbean as much because they didn't join us in the rebellion, but. I brought it up because I, I know that in addition to being a paleontologist and an expert on proboscideans, you were also somewhat of a scholar of the history of paleontology, and that's something you know a lot about. And if someone asked me why Jefferson was obsessed with these megafaunas, I would have said it's because he had an inferiority complex and was fighting with a guy from Spain. <laughs> or from not Spain, France. France, France. He did. <laughs> yeah. Yep, yep. Because... because <laughs> Well, there was this French, there was this French naturalist who literally had his theory of American degeneracy. <laughs> he, thought, he just thought America was like a worthless continent that didn't have any good animals. And, and the land itself was swampy and terrible. And if the land itself is swampy and terrible and the animals are terrible, then the people who live there, he wasn't even like strictly racist against the indigenous people. He even thought like the colonists would be like <laughs> swampy and terrible when, <laughs> just for living there. So he really yeah, did not like America and he and Jefferson kind of had a feud over it, over an academic feud. And the best part is that he had never even been to the Americas. So he's just kind of sitting in his scientific salon in Paris, theorizing about the degeneracy of the Americas. And it really pissed Jefferson off. And so he sends And them, I mean, he, Buffon was super popular. He oh, was yeah. like the Neil deGrasse Tyson or Carl Sagan of his day. Yep. Like every, you know, people respected this guy's opinion and, and his books were very widely read. So really got under Jefferson's skin. Mm-hmm. Is that and why he, Jefferson wanted to find living animals? To yes. Ah. yes. Ah. So he sends Lewis and Clark out to find a passage to, to the West. But on this quest, he also told them to, to go see if, if they could find any evidence of Mastodons. Listen. And I mean, Jefferson didn't also, he also didn't really believe in extinction. So that was another reason that he was obsessed with finding living ones. Because he's like, if we found the bones, they must still be alive because things don't go extinct. Yep. That would be insane. Yeah. So that has uh, nothing to, other than just kind of the, the history of mastodons, but I didn't even really let you get into what mastodons are as animals. And I imagine a lot of people confuse them with mammoths. So can we, h- how do we clarify the distinctions between these two proboscideans? Right. Because in, in, in popular art, they're also depicted as these large hairy elephants with long curved tusks. But they're actually a fairly ancient lineage of proboscideans. Sidians, which which first appear in Africa sometime around 30 million years ago. And then they leave, and just like the mammoths, they spread through Eurasia and then come into North America sometime around 16 million years ago, so a lot earlier than, than the mammoths. And then they go in and have their independent radiation on the continent, and the last two species are the American and Pacific Mastodon. And they've got a range that 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 also a, a extended all the way from Alaska down into Mexico and 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 Central uh, America. So it's this fairly uh, flexible animal that 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 could live in a variety of, of of climates. But based on its teeth, we know that 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 it liked to eat leaves and and, and twigs. So mammoths were, were grazers, but mastodons are browsers. And, and brazing and grousing have specific ecological definitions in this context. It's not, those ter- terms are actually distinct. Right. Um, which I think is, is not how most people tend to use them in just everyday English. Right. Grazing ecologically it refers to eating grass, whereas browsing ecologically means that you're browsing on leaves and twigs. That is the one huh. Wikipedia edit I've ever made for Eohippus because it said that it was a, a, a grazing in the forest. And I was like, I'm going to go in and edit browsing in the forest. It's just not possible because <laughs> grass is... That's literally, that's, that's, for all of my pedantry, that is the only correction I've ever made on Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> but coming back to Mastodon, so... It, the, so, so this this paper which, which came out, I think it was earlier this year, was about sequencing the the genomes of about thirty five mastodons from across the, the continent, and what they found was that mastodons repeatedly dispersed up into Alaska from south of the ice, colonized there. And when the ice sheets grew again, they either died or they came back south. So there was this constant 
migration of mastodons from, from south of the ice up north into Alaska. And we can tell this based on the genetic similarity that we see in populations north of the ice in, in, in Alaska and the Yukon and south of the ice. And we will get into that, but very quickly before we dive in much further, I'll just go ahead and say that the, the paper is titled American Mastodon Mitochondrial Genomes Suggest Multiple Dispersal Events in Response to Pleistocene Climate Oscillations. Very long list of authors. The first author is Emil Karpinski, and the final author, who I believe the work was done in their lab, was Hendrik Poinar, who just done a lot of great work on paleogenetics and paleogenomics. And then there's also, you know, there's a Real cool list of who's who's names here. We got Blaine Schubert up at the Gray site, who's been a guest on this show before. Dan Fisher, who's a well-known proboscidean paleontologist, a student of Stephen Jay Gould himself, which is really cool. And then I just noticed while we were getting into the introduction, one of the authors on this paper is one of the guys excavating the mammoth site in Mexico. <laughs> I noticed that too. Yeah. Yeah. Joaquin Arroyo Cabrales. Joaquin? Yep. Yep. Uh, so I thought that was, I didn't even notice that connection until while we were recording. I don't think any of us would claim to be experts in this kind of paleontology, but do we want to talk briefly about like the mitochondrial DNA and why that's an appropriate tool for testing these sorts of things? Yeah, so there we have two kinds of, of, of DNA in our cells. We've got nuclear uh, DNA, which is in, which is inherited from our fathers, and mitochondrial uh, DNA. Fathers and mothers. The nuclear DNA is the one that's been recombined between both. Oh, parents. right. Yes, uh, but. My, but the mitochondrial uh, DNA only comes from from the female. Now, it, I, I, I'm not sure why we don't get a lot of nuclear uh, DNA, but it seems like mitochondrial DNA preserves a lot better. And prior to this study, there were only two mitogenomes known from Mastodon. So what they've done is really expanded our data set of, of, of Mastodon genomics. And the cool thing about, you know, when I, when I offered the correction that nuclear DNA recombines, what that means is that every time a new offspring is generated with the, the combination of the sperm and the egg, you get, you know, a new set of DNA functionally for that individual to be their own individual. Whereas with mitochondrial DNA, the I think may, this might be one of the reasons why it's a little easier to extract is that the DNA itself isn't recombined. So it's the exact set of chromosomes from mom being passed down into the offspring of that she produces. And so it, it stays pretty consistent relative to nuclear DNA, which is constantly being recombined, which is the whole point of having a sexual reproductive strategy in the first place. And that's useful for studies like this because you still get the mutations, right? You still have these mutations that happen. A lot of mutations that happen in DNA are silent. They don't actually change what is encoded uh, in the programming of the DNA, so to speak. But we know about the rate at which things tend to mutate. And so based on that rate of just sort of background silent mutation, we can then sort of map out in time how things were moving around and who's related to who. Because like if an A switches to a G, you know, we can tell that that might have happened within a certain period of time and, and that that group is moving one way and the other group is moving a, a different way. So it, I don't know, is that a good explanation of sort of yeah. how they were using yep. the DNA to get at the migration question? Yep. Uh, and one of the other reasons they did that is because the idea is that Mastodons lived in Alaska and the Yukon during the interglacial periods, which were warm in intervals. And you can't use radiocarbon dating beyond 50,000 years, and the last interglacial maximum was at about 120,000 years ago. And it gets really tricky to date uh, fossils that are older than about 50,000 years, especially these isolated bones and teeth that are coming out of non-stratigraphic contexts. So what this means is that you're up in Alaska or the Yukon and you're a gold miner and you're just kind of like plowing through the, the permafrost trying, trying, trying to get at, at the gold bearing gravels and every so often a, a tooth will pop out and they'll go and donate this to, to a museum. But now we have no idea where in the strat column this, this, this tooth comes from. So we can't even get a relative sense of how old this specimen is. And because we know that Macedons are these warm adapted taxa that live there in the interglacials, they, they probably live there older than about, about 50,000 years, which is what they're finding. So that was a question I actually had is, 
is this finding a surprise to folks like you, Advai, or was this sort of confirming a, a suspicion that was already had about these animals? So there was a study that was done, I think, in 2014 by Grant Zazula. He's a, one of the authors, I believe, um, where they redated a bunch of Mastodon material. And what they showed was that the Mastodons in the Yukon went ex- extinct before the last glacial maximum and never came back after. And so this study is kind of a follow-up to that because what it's showing is that Mastodons migrated up in the warm uh, periods, probably died out in the peak of the of the glaciations because when you have a glacial maximum, it's fairly dry and fairly cold. And the kind of vegetation that you have in, 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 in that part of the world is the mammoth steppe, which is a giant grassland. You don't have the leaves and twigs that these animals need to, to survive. So they go locally extinct. And then these populations are replenished by, by populations from south of the ice once the ice-free corridor opens up. Now, what's neat is that after about 50,000 years, Macedons never come back up into Alaska. Hmm. But we've seen periods of dispersal going back possibly 200, 300,000 years ago. So there's something going on in the last 50,000 years that is preventing these southern Macedons from going north. I think it's people, but... I was going to say, is this is this one of those we're going to push back the date on human arrival to 50,000 now? <laughs> well, so the ice-free corridor opens up at about 23,000 years. And... It, but the Bering Land Bridge that humans crossed to get to North America from... Eurasia would have only been exposed during glacial maximum, right? That would yes, yes, because sea levels are are low enough for people to come over. Because literally, so much of the water is trapped in the ice, yep. right? Yep, yeah, and that's also why it's drier because mm-hmm. there's Absolutely. literally just less water available right. for you know rainfall. Right. So a lot of people might think that the ice age is characterized by by a lot of snowfall, but it doesn't actually snow that much just south of the ice because so much of the water is just trapped up in these ice sheets. Wow, so it's like Laramie. Yeah, it, it's kind of like <laughs> yeah. Laramie. Right, right. And you have this this giant step like 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 environment which is conducive for animals like like mammoths and, and bison and horses, but but it's not so great for woodland animals like moose and mastodon. So you okay? So you you mentioned that you know we have this fifty thousand year cutoff, but I don't. Did you answer the question of whether or not this was an expected find or a surprise? Well, it was a surprise because we didn't have good dates for most of the mastodons, but now that we have better dates, it kind of fits into what we've known for for a few years now about mastodon extinction in in the Yukon. Okay, so we're clarifying like the timing yes. and the population dynamics. Yep. Yep. That's cool. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it's it's hard enough to study fossils. It, 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 it's, it's even rarer to actually get DNA from these things. So once once we get a data set of, you know, 35 g- uh, genomes, you, you can do a lot of cool stuff. With, yeah, uh, I mean, we're getting... I, I personally am surprised with how quickly that technology has actually developed and gotten pretty good at getting DNA from pretty old stuff. Mm-hmm. I it's think, been an exciting yeah. development even within the length of our careers. Right. I, I think the oldest ancient DNA we have is from a 700,000-year-old horse. So it, it's really pushing the extremes of what we can extract. And these aren't even like the the samples they're pulling DNA from aren't even these like frozen mammoths we're pulling out of the Siberian tundra. Like these are just, you know, fossils. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. You can actually get, get DNA from natural trap cave. Which is 120-ish, I think, is the... Is that how I'm not sure how old natural trap cave is, but because of the cave environment, collagen and organic molecules preserve fairly well. Just because it's I did find I, I found a camel bone in there, Lindsay. So if you need some camel DNA, nice. That was the one big cool thing. I was obviously looking for a <laughs> cheetah or a sloth. There's no there's no sloths at all from natural trap cave. Uh, there are American cheetahs from natural trap cave. So I was obviously looking for a cheetah because that would have been really cool to find some cheetah material. Um, they, they, the natural trap cave is, is this really interesting fossil site in Wyoming, just south of the Montana border. And it's essentially this like hole in the ground in this sort of rolling rocky hill, hilly environment in sort of the foothills of the Beartooth mountains. And they think it's a runner's trap. So they think it's this like cave site that formed because if you were running away from a cheetah, (laughs) 
<laughs> you wouldn't see this hole in the ground until it was too late and you would just tumble in. And so it's just, you know, just this mound of, of bones at the bottom of this like 70 foot drop. And, and so it's to me, in support of that theory, there are no sloths from this site. <laughs> it's hard to imagine a sloth trying, even trying to outrun a cheetah. <laughs> American cheetahs probably weren't as fast as African cheetahs and ground sloths probably weren't as slow as tree sloths. But still, I imagine there was a pretty wide discrepancy in, in relative velocity amongst those two I animals. I bet they so. still tried to run, though. <laughs> I know. I imagine sloths were more of a stand your ground. I'm going to rear up on my hind legs and claw at you with my front paws sort of defense. <laughs> Maybe that's the that they went extinct. <laughs> 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 that is all right so that, that Ed explains Lindsay, so much Ed Ed Lindsay, i have a question based on my own outreach as a paleontologist and you are two other paleontologists that do a lot of outreach i have found that when i introduce a really cool what i think is a really cool like fossil taxa the one that immediately springs to mind is the uh the tooth whorl shark right it's a shark that looks like it has a circular saw on the front of its face yeah it's this insane looking animal and i show it to people and one of the questions I often get is, well, how did that thing even live? And I'm like, it didn't. It's extinct. <laughs> um, is that a good answer or am I doing a disservice? Should I be answering that differently? What do you guys think? You can start off with that, but then you could probably go on to explain how it may have actually used the world. Yeah, yeah. I, I often try to reframe it in like what what caused this or what, what f may have driven this adaptation to be workable at the time right. but maybe not a good long-term strategy right i mean um, that that's 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 the whole thing about evolution right it's a c-grade student it, it just does what works <laughs> it doesn't have to be perfect what do you think Lindsay? i agree i find that you need something to pull them in and that statement that you make is the way to get them in and then you can share a bit more information about what these animals are actually like because it's true. They did. They went extinct. So whatever their mechanism for survival or feeding, it didn't work well. But I think it's the perfect opportunity to really pull those people in. So you need a little bit of both. And it's the sort of, you know, on a long enough timeline, all species, species have a lifespan. I think this is something people don't think about who don't have a ton of experience with deep time, especially deep time of life, because I know Abe is, you know, volcanologist and, and geologist, so he understands the concept of deep time. But when it comes to life, you know, individuals have a lifespan. Uh, they're gone in a blink. <laughs> so, so species still kind of have a, a lifespan, too, where species tend to go extinct within about, is it like 25 million years or something like that? It's like, no, maybe not even that. It's like one every million years for mammals. Yeah. Explaining that to the general public is very difficult. Yes. Yes. Do you have to do much of that in your job, Lindsay, uh, your current job? No, most of my job is building the program right now, but I did an outreach event for National Fossil Day and you get a little bit of it. So I keep my toes in it, but it's not my main job. Gotcha. I, I feel like we're kind of wrapping up the, the Mastodon story. So Advai, I'll have one last question for you about this story. What would you say the take home message is for a study like this? And what should people think about when they, when they recall this story or think about it or want to tell somebody else about it? What's kind of the one big lesson that we should get from a study like this? That the Mastodons up in Alaska and the Yukon were fairly small or were represented by fairly small populations and it doesn't take a lot for fairly small populations to go extinct. There's a lot of inbreeding, and that takes a toll on your gene pool. And that's actually what's going on right now with a lot of species. We're pushing species into smaller and, and smaller populations, and then natural factors like, like climate change can just come in and, 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 and wipe them out. That is an excellent point. I'm glad you brought that up because this paper actually did have a cool paleo conservation angle yeah. that we did not touch on. Basically, when you model a population of mastodons like this, you are modeling a potential response of modern elephants to climate change. And I think one of the things that this paper showed is that as a strategy, it works in the short term to go north when it gets warm, but you got to have a plan for what comes next. Yep. Yep. And we're and I mean, uh, I'm a, a plan. These animals weren't planning. They were just following the, the food and the temperature gradients. But I think, you know, we're seeing northern migration of a lot of animals. And we might see it with some of the really large animals like elephants. And if they don't have a place to go, and if they don't have a place to safely breed, and if they don't have enough food, and if they don't, 
And if they don't have enough population size to keep their, their genetic diversity up, they, they could be in trouble. Right. Absolutely. I mean, this is what I like to talk about when I talk about how climate change causes e- e- extinctions. It doesn't cause it by itself for the most part. Most things can move around. That's what species are good at doing. But species need to move. And what we've done now is we've fragmented all of these species and their populations into islands in a sea of humanity. And so they can't move. So unless we go and connect habitat, species are going to try to move with the changing climates, but they're going to hit a brick wall, almost literally, and then go extinct. Yeah. And we've talked about that before on the show in terms of like bear populations are moving up mountains. You know, you think about a, a animal like the polar bear, sort of the, one of the iconic species of climate change. Where does it go? There's nowhere north left. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and there's only decreasing sea ice for them to, to hang out on. The pika up in the Rocky Mountains, like they're already at the top of the mountain. There's They can't go up anymore. So it's it's going to get, it's a uh, dire straits for some of these organisms. And I think this story of the American Macedon illustrates that nicely in a really cool, cool way. Absolutely. Advite, can you tell us a little bit about, you mentioned working out of the Yale Peabody Museum and that you guys are doing a big overhaul of the museum. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing or what's what's going on with you? So I came to Yale fairly late, so I wasn't involved with the Peabody renovation per se. But some of the work that I'm doing at Yale involves the extinction of, of large animals like the Macedons, but in the Indian subcontinent. So these mammoths and, and mastodons all go extinct as part of this, this global event called the megafaunal e- extinction, which takes place between about 50,000 years. And I would argue that it's continuing today. But for the longest time, we had no idea what's going on in the subcontinent. And so what I've done over the last few years is collect a data set of species that go extinct. And what I'm trying to, to do now is figure out when they go extinct and if climate change or or hunting or habitat change had anything to do with their demise. Uh, I'm also working on some, some projects with extinct dinotheres from the Indian subcontinent. So dinotheres are a kind of extinct elephant with a very short trunk and downturned tusks on their lower jaws. They're kind of the freaks of the elephant world. But we're finding new material in Western India, and I'm, and I'm trying to describe it to, to, to see exactly how many different kinds of dinotheres we, we had in the subcontinent. And that's, I mean... Awesome work. And we could have you, I mean, we obviously could and will have you back on to talk about everything you've been doing with paleontology in India. It's really fascinating the the way you've at least, for me, shown a light on all the interesting paleontology that's happening in this part of the world that I have much less experience with. So that's really exciting too. Are Lindsay and Advite, I know Advite, you're active on Twitter and, and have a web presence as well, but like where can people go in the worldwide internet to find out more about what each of you are doing? So you can find me on Twitter at, at A.M. Zucker, or you can find me on the web on my website, AdvaitZucker at Weekly.com. I think I, I'm pretty sure that's my website. <laughs> yep. Your website, I have it up now. AdvaitZucker.Weebly.com. Is... <laughs> Weebly.com. Yeah. Yep, I will link to it in the show notes, and I will link to your Twitter profile as well. What about you, Lindsay? Um, mostly it's through the National Parks website. And they're working on getting a page for me. But as of right now, it's just on the site in general. Um, But I can be reached by email if you want to stick that in the show notes or whatever. That's right. You're a federal employee. It's all public. Yes, it is. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, we're also, I can't be a principal investigator on any projects. So we are looking for students and faculty and staff that want to come and research at the site. Oh, that's awesome. Um, Amazing. Yeah, so if you have interest in taphonomy or mammoths or climate during the Pleistocene... To find taphonomy. (laughs) Basically, (laughs) everything that happens after death. So what happens to the bones, how they're buried, how they're preserved... Otherwise, Abe's going to have to go grab the taphonomist in the other room and have her explain it. I believe believe a critical (laughs) component is after death and before preservation... (laughs) No, no, preser- I mean, no, pres- it's during preservation. During. Yeah, yeah. It's it's everything from death up to a paleontologist finding it and sometimes after a paleontologist finding it if you are ah. imprecise with your hammer. <laughs> <laughs> As a lot I'm, of volunteers. Listen, right, I'm very precise with my hammer. 
That's fine. I mean, you you are guess I guess you're just not a very good taphonomic agent, unlike me, <laughs> <laughs> who is often asking for glue. <laughs> well, I don't it's ever fixed. need to put my volcanoes back together. <laughs> Yeah, I'm often, I'm often needing to fix my taphonomic mistakes when I'm in the prep lab. So, so sorry, Lindsay, I cut you off to make sure everybody was on the same page with what you were asking for projects on. But how, how can they get in touch if they're interested in doing a project at the Waco Mammoth site? So basically, we are taking students through Baylor University. They're a partnership with the park. So if you're interested in working on anything, if you shoot me an email, we can get you in contact with the appropriate people at Baylor. And if you're already established in a university, we are perfectly happy to work on some agreements so that we can get research done from wherever you may be located. That's awesome. That's really cool. I'm I'm super excited about the potential there. I, I, I'm really excited about what the future holds. Little research has been done on the site, so there are a lot of options that are still available. All right, Advite, let's put together a proposal. Yeah, definitely. You've got some mammoths down there. Maybe you'll find a sloth. It'll be great. I'll drill. I can drill the tusks. There we uh, go. You're the isotope guy. <laughs> yeah, we can. Aww. Lindsay's an isotope guy. Too. We're isotope. <laughs> we're isotope. It, it, we are literally, we are quite literally isotopic. Symptoms. Not that you need another isotope geochemist, but I'm available. <laughs> I'm sorry, Abe. I don't think this has anything to do with volcanoes. Well, actually, yeah. Abe. So there, there's a site in Mexico where there's a bunch of mammoths preserved in a lahar. Oh, let's go! Yes. Whoa, yeah, that's awesome. All right, so we, so we've all got our projects. Everybody's got their assignments for next time. Thank you so much. I'll provide the beer. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot wait. That'll be great. Well, I, uh, thank you both for for joining us to talk about these two mammoth stories. I realize we touched ever so briefly on the, the work that you're both actively doing. I know we could do an entire other episode with each of you individually or having you both back on to talk about just the work you are doing, but I appreciate you coming on to talk about these cool stories. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, thanks, Abe. This has been fun. Yeah, thank you both. Thank you both, James. We Abe and I were, were prepping a previous episode and our, our co-host and friend Joe, and we were trying to figure out what stories we were going to cover. And Joe was like, oh, well, it's kind of cool that like there's this mastodon story and there's mammoth story. And I was like, that is <laughs> Well, Joe, good point. You are not allowed to talk about them. I'm going to reach out to Ed and see you get them. <laughs> <laughs> we did it on the spot. Yeah, no, like Joe was ready to record on those two topics. And we're like, nope, Joe, you're going to talk about some engineering or something. We got we got, we got mammoth people in our back pocket to pull out and make talk about this stuff. So <laughs> I'm glad it worked out. Yeah. Well, thanks again for, for joining us, and we will let you get on with your day. Uh, but hopefully folks will go and check out the show notes at scienceor.com, where I'll include links to these stories and links to your personal website or national park website and Twitter handle and all that fun stuff. Email for Lindsay if you want to do a project on some Waco mammoths. And uh, yeah, thanks and have a great rest of the day. You Thank too. You. Thank you. Thank you. So thanks again to Lindsay and Advite for giving us some other time this evening to talk about not their own research necessarily, but some other cool research that's happening in the Proboscidean world and uh, yeah. looking forward to having them back on at some point to talk about their own work. Yeah, that was fantastic. And, you know, obviously the, the two articles we talked about relate at least to what they're doing currently, if not what they've done in the past. So that was pretty fun. If folks have more questions about mammoths, mastodons, proboscideans, or anything in that realm and they want to let us know what those questions are, they can go to sciencewar.com where they will find the show notes for this episode as well as in the contact form where they can email us or send in a voicemail. We haven't had a voicemail sent in in a while. 321... Yeah. It's Paleo, Paleo Pal. Pals. That's 312-725-3672. <laughs> That's completely from memory. That might be wrong. Paleo <laughs> Pals. Just remember to Di do Paleo... Dial that number and tell us what happens. <laughs> and if you do that... Send it to us in an email. It, it, or send us a voicemail file, you know, recording in an email. And if you do that, you might be featured on the final segment of the show. And that segment is called Paleo Path. <laughs> oh, good job barking hey. on the cube, Clementine. <laughs> I was going to say, was that Clem? Yeah. Yeah, Clem.
The Paleo Power is the final segment of the show where we delight in the feedback from our listeners. Abe, what listener are you delighting in this time? Well, I am delighting in the fact that one of our listeners, Jesse O., has decided to give us a recurring PayPal donation, which is fantastic. Thank you so much, Jesse. The donations that all of our listeners sent our way actually help us a lot in uh, making sure that we can continue to produce this content and keep it free available to everybody who wishes to listen to it. It covers costs for uh, you know equipment and hosting the actual show online. So keeping our website running, all that good stuff. So thanks a million. Yeah, and Jesse is one of the holdovers who has a recurring PayPal donation even after we switched to the Patreon system and we got in the habit of giving the Patreon theses out to folks who are Patreon donors, but we still had a few lingering PayPal recurring donors that didn't get thanked properly in a formal episode, so we want to make sure we take care of that, and so we're taking some time in these episodes to make sure we, we get everybody who's contributed to the show. Cause we, you know, I, I really do think of our listeners as a community of people who are all contributing to making the show happen. And so it's important that we say thanks when thanks are needed. Absolutely. I want to say thanks to former guest of the show and friend of mine and, and collaborator and colleague, Alex Hastings, who is a paleontology curator at the science museum of Minnesota. We've had him on to talk about, crocodile stuff. And he was interviewed by the Minnesota Star Tribune, the local paper. And one of the things they asked him was, you know, what podcast he listened to or how, how he spends his free time. And he mentioned that he listens to science sort of. And that was really cool. I really appreciated him doing that. And so uh, by way of thanks, Turnabout Being Fair Play, I want to point out that Alex and his wife, Katie, have started a podcast of their own called Squabbling Squibs. And it is sort of a, a nerd culture, science, and a, a lot of B-movie content. They did a a multi-episode breakdown of the science of Jurassic Park, and I know we've done similar things to that, but, you know, Alex is a, a great science communicator and a, a great nerd, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, into a lot of the same nerdy stuff that I'm into. So I would recommend, they've got, you know, episodes on like Tolkien and science, the evil dead, the mythology of Wonder Woman. So, you know, I, I have a feeling that if folks like the content they hear on Science Sort of, they will also enjoy Squabbling Squibs. Absolutely. I look forward to having Alex and po possibly Katie as well on the show in the future at some point to to just have them back on to talk about what's going on in their lives, but also, you know, give them a chance to talk about Squabbling Squibs and maybe do a little crossover episode. So we'll see. Yeah. Um, I'm just excited about the possibility. I was really flattered that Alex mentioned us in his interview and uh, just wanted to say thanks and make sure people knew about his new project. Yeah, absolutely. What about you, Abe? What what new what new projects do you have? Oh, current projects are making it through uh, through the year. <laughs> <laughs> I'm worried about making it through next week, man. I don't know oh, how you're, you got this year long perspective. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's, it's uh, you know, hoping that uh, the year turns quick. But uh, I'm excited about the fall weather that we are finally getting. It's been nice and cool consistently the past few weeks here and. Um, that's pretty nice because I, I enjoy that a lot more than the, you know, hot and humid weather that we've had for months. And I'm also excited for the winter, actually. I, I, <laughs> I like the cooler temperatures. I'm I'm one of those unicorns. The, the Arctic Mexican. Yeah. I, as, I, I've, I, as I've called you. I stand true to that. Uh, so how about you? I have been... I think I, I think I needed like an extrovert system purge because I've just been going on podcasts left and yeah. right. <laughs> I've been doing the podcast, you know, with y'all, which I which I love doing. It's one of my favorite parts of the week. But I also recently was featured on the AGU podcast, which is Third Pod from the Sun. They did a podcast that was sort of Halloween themed, so it was about mythical monsters and their real life inspirations. So they talked about mermaid mythology and I came on to talk a little bit about Bigfoot mythology and some potential connections to my research. I won't Thanks. give away the secret of it here uh, on this episode, but you can go check that out at third pod, their podcast feed, which I will link to in the show notes. And I was also on the most recent episode of I fanboys pick of the week podcast, where we talked about fantastic four number 25, as well as a bunch of other comics. And that was a super fun show. I've been reading, I've been reading the mighty Morphin power Rangers comic. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's fantastic. One? Yeah, well, it's a new one. It's been going for like 50 issues, 55 oh, issues. Wow. And honestly, it's it's the original team, right? Uh -huh. So it's, 
you know, it's Jason, Trini, Zach, Billy, Tommy, Kimberly. And, yeah. It's really good. <laughs> I really <laughs> like it a lot. <laughs> I'm not surprised. <laughs> so Connor and Josh, the two main co of I fanboy are a little bit old. They're just old enough, older enough than you and I that like Power Rangers <laughs> was the, the kit, the thing that the stupid kids were into. Mm-hmm. So it's really fun to get to like kind of uh, needle them on like, let me tell you how all this cool stuff going on in Power Rangers. And like when I talk about how like they repaired the green Morphin coin so the green Power Ranger was able to come back even though Tommy is still actively as the White Ranger. Like, it, it's nonsense, but it's not that much more nonsense than talking about what happened in Fantastic Four that month. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's fair. It's just yeah, a yeah. different different context. So that's been fun. And then I um, also gave an interview yesterday, and I, only, I won't say what that is, because that's probably not going to be out in time for this episode, uh-huh. so I will announce what that interview was for when it is available for everyone to go listen to. So Sounds like that's what's going plan. on with me. I'm just, uh, I've just been you know, needing to be an extrovert and the best way I can do that these days is podcasting. (laughs) Well, we meet up occasionally. We, we had lovely lunch outdoors yesterday. That was nice. At a distance. Picnic lunch. Yeah. 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 Stayed, stayed, stayed distant, but near, near enough to talk. Yeah. I could hear you. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, Well, I've also, um, this, this month actually, I decided to, this was something that I can credit you and uh, and Jesse for, but you guys got me on Jason Aaron's Thor run with Marvel Comics, and I've started to pick up some of the issues that I uh, that I was. I feel missing. like I've been telling you to read that for years. Well, and you got me. Well, on your, I believe it was your bachelor party when we went to Powell's Books. I got the first issue of the Mighty Thor. Not, God not the Mighty Thor. The uh, Thor, yeah, God Butcher. So I had picked up that the rest of that series uh, in the last couple of, couple of years. But this month, I decided I needed to finally continue with the rest of his Thor run. And so I picked up the Thor Goddess of Thunder. Nice. What a fantastic series. That has been really awesome. Russell Dowderman just killed it on yeah. that book. Oh my god. His art his art is incredible. It's, it's it's amazing. And then this week I started reading Original Sin, the Loki and Thor part of it as it relates to the timeline with Thor. And I also have the Mighty Thor on the dock. So oh, and Secret Wars and then King Thor. And basically, I've lined up the entire Jason Aaron run with Thor to do in the next month. And then Dark Horse Comics has started publishing a comic book adaptation of Neil Gaiman's North Norse mythology book. Really? Yep. So if you want some some more, if you need more Norse myth, I know you're always on the lookout for more Norse. <laughs> myth. I oh, you know, I'll I'll plug in one that I recently, and I think you probably introduced me to it, but Heathen. Heathen? Yeah. However you pronounce that, Heathen? Yeah, Heathen. Yeah, Heathen by uh, uh, Natasha Altarishi. I just finished that last month. Isn't that a fan- fantastic? Oh, it's it's probably one of my favorites right now, up there with, with Northman. Yeah, Heathen is a fantastic comic put out by Vault Comics. Yep. The first volume was written and drawn by Natasha Altarichi, like you said, second volume is written by her, drawn by somebody else, because uh, she actually had a hand injury, I think. Right, yeah, she did. that's right. So she needed some help uh, illustrating it, but fantastic comic about a, a young Viking woman who has to leave her clan for reasons I won't spoil because it's worth finding out for yourself. But then the gods take an interest in her her quest. So it's a really cool little sort of travel story with fantastical mythical elements. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, so that and Northlanders have become my two favorite Viking related comic books series. So very strongly recommended. And Jason Aaron just wrapped up his run on Thor a couple of months ago. Yeah. And Donny Cates took over. And Donny Cates has been killing it. Like, he's yeah. doing a really... Okay. I honestly, I honestly was like, I don't know how somebody takes over after Jason Aaron. I, right. So, up. so that's what kind of prompted me to go ahead and finish. It's like, all right, now that I know <laughs> where it ends or, you know, what, what the end for his series is... I'd like to be able to have closure, uh, you know, and have a goal. I think Donny Cates did the did the really smart thing, and he basically just didn't ignore what Jason Aaron has done, but just kind of was like, I'm going to start a new story, and it's going to be a legitimate new starting point for the Thor story, 
and they did a really, I, I thought, awesome. a really nice costume redesign. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it picked, I guess it's a bit of a spoiler to tell you that, like, the end of Jason Aaron run is Thor as King of Asgard. And so, like, that's basically the only link is that Thor is still King of Asgard. So it's sort of a heavy as the head that wears the crown situation. But other than that, like, he's doing his own thing with it, and it's really good. Okay. I'll have to, once I wrap up uh, Jason Aaron's series. Yeah, I'll, read through I'll all that first, to. for sure. I'll have to move on, not not move on as in away, but uh, continue with this. Excellent, because I've been very very happy with with this. So, well, if you need more Jason Aaron books, you should check out Scalped. I don't know if you ever read Scalped. It's it's <laughs> so I almost purchased the Scalped series, but instead decided that I needed the the complete Thor series from Jason Aaron. So I, I put that on hold for the time being. But I'm I'm. It's 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 on my to do for reading down the line. It's worth it's worth checking out when you have the chance. It's very much like it, it's sort of like the Sopranos or Breaking Bad, but uh -huh. a, told you know a, on a Indian reservation in the Dakotas, yeah, sort of thing. It's it's a lot of characters that are like your motivations may be good, but you're doing a lot of really bad stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, so Scalped and uh, Black Road, yeah, are, Black are Road. two yeah. that are on my on the docket after. I finished Thor, but All right. well, if, if, if there are Viking comics that Abe and I are unaware of, please let us yeah. know. Cause I feel like we've got this space pretty well locked down <laughs> and Abe is reading stand still stay silent as well. So we've even got the I web am, comic yeah. presence covered, but if, you know, if people know of Viking comics that we haven't been reading, let us know and we will read them. Yep. Please do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't a planned tangent, but I'm glad we, we talked about it for a little bit. And yeah. I think with that, we'll go ahead and uh, wrap up the show for folks. So thank you everyone for listening. Thanks again to Avite Lindsay for some of their time. Yeah. Audio production for this episode by Rob Heath at Rob Heath Studios. So thank you, Rob, for taking care of Thanks, us. Thanks, Rob. In the audio editing department science sort of.com is the website science sort of on twitter and facebook for social media interactions and yeah go check out the show notes lots of good links in there and thank you for listening yeah thanks ryan for uh hosting another fantastic show i'm pretty sure i know what the next episode is but i yes clementine <laughs> i do don't be skeptical, Clementine. I do know what the next episode is going to be because I thought it was actually going to come before this episode, but we had to rearrange the interview time. So it'll be a really good interview with an expert in the field. So I'm excited about that. I won't say more until I've actually awesome. got it in the can. But I can guarantee that the next episode, interview or not, we'll have a whole lot more science. Sort of. Sort of. Sort of. Sort of. Visit sciencesortof.com for show notes, links to all the stories we talked about, and ways to interact with the hosts, guests, and other listeners. Science Sort of is brought to you by the Brachialobe Media Network of Podcasts, with audio engineering by Tim Dobbs of the Encyclopedia Brunch Podcast. That's all for this week. See you next time on Science Sort of. The only question left to figure out is which one would you like to talk about first? Whichever is fine with me. We could do the mammoth story. Okay, we'll start with mammoths. Yeah. And then, then we can move on to, to mastodons and extinction and whatnot. We'll end with extinction. That's yeah, usually a good place go. to end things. Right. <laughs> <laughs> usually you don't have a choice. <laughs>